Beware of history, Algeria's army chief evokes the civil war of the 1990s to warn protesters who've been demanding the president's resignation. So how will they respond? And who's really in charge in Algeria? This is Inside Story. Hello again, I'm James Bayes. The biggest protests in years against Algeria's president are gaining strength. Thousands of people have been rallying for nearly two weeks, urging Abdelaziz Bouteflika to pull out of next month's election. The 82-year-old has been in power for two decades, but is rarely seen in public after suffering a stroke in 2013. Bouteflika issued a letter saying he won't complete a full term if he's re-elected. Now the army chief is trying to quell the protests by evoking memories of the civil war of the 1990s. 200,000 people were killed in the aftermath of the 1992 military coup that came during an election. We'll bring in our guests to discuss all this in a moment, but first, bring us up to speed this report from Emma Haywood. They've known no other leader than the one that's ruled their country for 20 years. But there appears to be a groundswell against Algeria's Abdelaziz Bouteflika. In the capital, Algiers, the message from thousands of demonstrating students was clear. They want him to leave office now. We are against Bouteflika and against the regime. We are fed up. 20 years are enough. We want change. They've been in power for 20 years. We've overlooked the situation for too long. We've been too passive. It's time now for people to wake up and not just citizens. Some students were forced to cover their faces, suffering from the effects of tear gas. This outpouring of anger began when Algeria's ailing leader announced he would run for a fifth term as president. The cry for Bouteflika to step aside has been growing louder every day spreading beyond the boundaries of Algiers. The military, which helped lead and shape the country during and after the bloody civil war in the 1990s, wields power here, and its military chief says it wants to guarantee Algeria's security. Some parties, which feel annoyed to see Algeria secure and stable, do not like it. They want to take Algeria back to the years of pain, during which the Algerian people suffered all kinds of suffering and paid a heavy price. The great people who lived through such difficult times will never give up the bounty of security. President Bouteflika suffered a stroke six years ago and has rarely been seen in public since then. He's offered to shorten any new term in power, but many here believe that doesn't go far enough. Several days of protests against his rule have led to more than 200 people being injured. The right to free expression is part of the Algerian constitution. We expect that those rights be respected where there is peaceful demonstrations under the rule of law. The military has warned that some people want to take Algeria backwards. Protesters say they are looking ahead, trying to secure a better future. And after 20 years, it is time for change. Emma Hayward, Al Jazeera. Well, let's bring in our guests to discuss this further. In Algiers, joining us on Skype, we have Amal Boubaker. She's a research fellow at the Paris-based School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences. In Oxford in the UK, we have Michael Willis. He's the author of politics and power in the Maghreb, Algeria, Tunisia and Morocco, from independence to the Arab Spring. And here with me in Doha, Yusuf Bouandal. He's Professor of International Affairs at Qatar University. Welcome to you all. Can I start with you, Amal? You're there in Algiers. I, I know you're not a reporter, you're an analyst, but I would not like you, perhaps, to give us an idea. What does it feel like? What's the mood there right now? Well, the mood, the mood here has changed a lot. I mean, uh, three weeks ago, people were in kind of despair. There was there was this discourse that actually uh, the country is not going to evolve anymore, that there's no life left for the people here. And, and suddenly, 
uh, the, the discourse has changed and there's a lot of hope and people are really optimistic. But I would say that it has not changed uh, without any reason. Uh, an important question is asked is why now? Why do we have a lot of uh, demonstrations now and massive protests now? Well, first, it, I believe it's linked to the nature of the, of the regime itself. You know, for uh, the past two mandates, uh, this, uh, the vacuum that has been left by Bouteflika uh, was thought as, uh, as uh, not threatening by, by the ruling elite and people who are uh, behind Bouteflika. But uh, what happened actually is that Algerian got used to live without any president. They got, they got used to uh, live without any representative institutions, parliaments, uh, parties. Uh, even the, the elections uh, uh, process. So they finally thought that they may live without the president and that they may uh, uh, regain uh, their country's future. Uh, you know, for the, since the, the, end, the end of the civil war, uh, the regime has insist, insisted uh, to uh, uh, make the Algerians believe that if they, they, they should not trust each other, that uh, if they go on with discussing with each other in the streets, a new uh, civil war may, may, may happen again. But finally, they uh, understood that they uh, could, I mean, took time to them to uh, regain trust with each other, but they finally did so. And that's why you heard uh, during the protest, Silmiya, Silmiya, uh, peaceful demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations every time. So this is where they are now. They have gain again trust uh, in each other and trust that they can ask for change peacefully. OK, Yusuf, you're with me here in Doha. You also are an expert, you're an academic, but you're also an Algerian. How does this mood feel right now, where we are right now? Are you excited or are you nervous? Well, uh, both, actually. You have to be excited to see Algerian youth united demonstrations all over the country from Annaba, in the east to Tlemcen, the, the city where most of the Algerian government uh, originates from. We saw people in Algiers demonstrating where the Algerian law prohibits demonstrations from Algiers. I think the last one goes back to 2001. Obviously, people are very united uh, around one particular idea, no to the fifth term of President Bouteflika. That's how he started. And the second thing is now that the people want to bring down the regime. So it's very exciting times for Algeria, but at the same time, one needs to be uh, cautious be that these demonstrations may go out of hand and it becomes violence. And we all uh, saw what happened in the 90s. I don't think that we, it will go into violence because it seems to me that Algerians have learned the lessons of the 90s. They also uh, learned the lessons from the Arab Spring countries. And like uh, Amel said from Algiers, so the world or the buzz world for these demonstrations has always been Silmiya, Silmiya, peaceful, peaceful. And when we see the, the, the youth after the demonstrations cleaning the streets, they're trying to tell the leadership in Algeria, as well as uh, the outside world, that our demands are legitimate. We are doing our bit to take our country forward. You say that the main demand right now is no to a fifth term of Bouteflika. Michael in Oxford, he basically has been unwell throughout his fourth term. Um, very, very unwell, it seems. He's not really seen in public very often. Who really is running Algeria and has been running it in recent years? Well, this is a very good question, and I think this is behind a, a lot of the protests and the unhappiness, that since he had his stroke in 2013, uh, he hasn't, as you said, been in public. He's not able to, to stand or walk, and he has a great deal of difficulty speaking, and he appears in public two or three times a year. He didn't even campaign in his last election in 2014. And I think part of the problem is where sort of it's a repeat of what happened five years ago. I think last, uh, the last time he was elected for his fourth term in 2014, I think he was given a, a degree of benefit of a doubt, thinking, well, this may be a last term. The political leadership need time to find a successor. But they've now had five years, and it cl it, it's clear that they haven't been able to come up on a ca uh, candidate they agree with to replace uh, Bouteflika. 
Um, and a lot of people find this extremely frustrating and humiliating, but they're now represented by a man who, who wasn't even able to file his, um, uh, um, his papers to be a, to, to be a candidate. Uh, people were particularly unhappy over recent years where at, uh, at uh, um, national celebrations and national days, the president was, was represented by an enormous framed picture of himself making Algeria look like some sort of bizarre cult or North Korea. And a lot of ordinary Algerians found that very humiliating uh, and very frustrating. Perhaps you can give us some more details on this, Amel. I mean, people in lots of countries rage about the deep state, but it seems Algeria really is run by the deep state. Give us some idea who is in this shadowy cabal. I was mentioning uh, previously how uh, uh, the regime has uh, been uh, caught in his own trap by uh, uh, trying to maintain at all costs uh, the figure of a president, uh, of a civilian president, has uh, even in his physical absence. But I would say that even the army, who is also another important part of this decision making uh, group that is uh, leading Algeria, has also been caught by his, uh, its, its own discourse, how that, uh, you know, for years, and especially since the end of, of the civil war, the army has repeated uh, uh, instantly uh, that they were not going to be involved in politics anymore. Uh, and finally, paradoxically, Algerians have bought this discourse. And with uh, Gaït Saler, the, the, the vice president of, of, of defense ministry yesterday, and who the, is the one who represents uh, the, uh, the military commandment, uh, with his discourse threatening uh, Algerians not to take the streets because the army won't tolerate uh, to get back to the civil war days. Well, actually, Algerians are totally disconnected from this, this, uh, this discourse. Why that? Because, as I said, they bought the idea that the army has not to intervene in politics, that the army is only there to protect the uh, country's boundaries and frontiers and, and not to uh, give uh, uh, an orientation or, or to take the leadership of, of, of politics and what is going on. So we should now, of course, we, we, we have all these narratives on the, on the war of clans and so on, but if you uh, look very closely uh, to what is important and what makes sense to the Algerians, it's none of these narratives. What makes sense to the Algerian now is not who is leading Algeria, but just to get rid of the regime, as they said, and they have made it very clear. We are not only about after uh, Bouteflika only, but we want to get rid of the regime. So there's a new culture of participation and leadership that is, uh, that is emerging uh, within the civil society, within the ranks of the students, lawyers, uh, uh, high school uh, pupils and so on, and, 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 and women, I mean, all, all, all uh, members of, 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 the, of the Algerian society. And we should be uh, quite, uh, we should look closely at, at this uh, new culture of participation and leadership that is emerging. You're talking there quite a bit about the military. It's interesting, 24 hours ago, I was in this chair discussing Venezuela, asking what are the military going to do next. It's very much one of the most important questions here as we focus on the army of uh, Algeria. Let's take a closer look. It's played a major role in politics since independence from France in 1962. It's one of the most powerful armies in Africa with nearly 800,000 personnel. In 1992, the military launched a coup, just as many believed the Islamic Salvation Front was about to win a second round of the election, the first democratic election since independence. This marked the start of Algeria's so-called black decade of civil war that killed at least 200,000 people and injured many more. Yusuf, we have the statement from the head of that army, uh, General Ahmed Ged Salah, he said, Algeria's army will guarantee security and not allow return to an era of bloodshed. But then he sort of, was it a veiled threat? He talked about the years of pain. Well, I, would, I wouldn't read it as a threat per se, because over the last uh, few years, they have been talking about the role of the military to basically to protect the frontiers of the country and not to get involved in, uh, in politics. So obviously with the, the, these uh, demonstrations, he reminded basically people that, I mean, with the, the countries of the Arab Spring in mind, he reminded the Algerians that these peaceful demonstrations may turn 
violent. I think that the, um, it's not a warning. I would read it as much as an advice to those. Obviously, the the uh, the army see, uh, sees itself as the protector of the country. Like uh, you said earlier on, it has a big say in how the country is run. It, all the Algerian presidents, including Bouteflika, were brought in by the military, uh, and it sees itself as the custodian of the nation. Obviously, it would not allow things to uh, go out of hands, but as long as the demonstrations are uh, peaceful, then I think that the military will step aside. It's interesting, isn't it, Michael, that so far in these protests, yes, you've had the riot police out there and tear gas and some, uh, some arrests, but the military have stayed in their barracks. Do you think the military will stay united, Michael? Um, I, I, I think so. I mean, at the moment, as you said, it's the police dealing with it. And I, I think, as Professor Buandil said, I think there is a great reluctance to get involved. Um, the military are involved in the political leadership. Gaid Salah, the head of the army, is one of the key figures in, in, the, le in the political leadership. Um, the army, in, in, there were, the last time that Algeria had significant social unrest was in October 1988. And then the army did come onto the streets and kill significant numbers of people. But that was extraordinarily controversial and damaged the image of the army. And I think the army would be very, very reluctant uh, to go down that path again. Uh, and I, I agree that Gaid Salah's statement, the head of the army's statement, is really to try and defuse the situation. Um, but I think that uh, they're as confused and uncertain as the rest of political leadership. The political leadership in Algeria tends to like to do things slowly and, not in, and um, behind closed doors. So this situation is very, very awkward for it. It doesn't like moving at this pace and it doesn't like this um, having to discuss these things openly. Amal, if I can ask you there in Algiers, clearly there were protests at the time of the Arab Spring, and yet they didn't go anywhere. Uh, why was that back then, and is it different this time? Well, uh, you know, when uh, first uh, demonstrations, uh, sit-ins and protests have started in Algeria right uh, before, uh, long before the Arab Spring, uh, long before 2011, there has always been a tradition of resistance within the ranks of, of, of the Algerians. Even if the Algerians was, were, were not participating in the official political life that they uh, uh, thought uh, to be uh, inexistent and not made, made by them or for them, uh, they always uh, have been highly politicized. Uh, uh, in coffee discussions, making private jokes about the, the, the leadership and, and the army, uh, and even by uh, have, uh, doing life-threatening tentative of illegal, illegal uh, uh, and clandestine immigration. So Algerians have always been highly politicized. But uh, the problem is that these demonstrations I, will, I, I, will, I was mentioning were always asking for the state to come back. And they never found it. They only found the, re the regime. So I believe this is the problem. And as I said in my introduction, the fact that now people are no more interested by the regime's answer or the state uh, or the existence of the state and have the willingness to build their own state, this is what is what is actually different this time. And there's also a feeling that we should renew or, or reconnect uh, with uh, past struggles. I mean, there have been a lot, a lot, a lot of references to uh, the war of independence in Algeria and the fact that Algerians were also inheritors of this story, that they were also revolutionaries. So this is a deep feeling even in the, in the, uh, among the, the youngest one. So this is, uh, there's no real uh, um, reference to the Arab Spring as such. There's really a sense that this is the long Algerian history that has been an accumulation of struggles within the Algerian civil society of techniques of resistance. And that's what may change the, the situation that time. Youssef, um, we've heard Amal there talk about the history and there has been a violent past in your country, the war of independence against France and then uh, the very dark days of the 1990s. Is it significant given that that so many of these people on the streets are so young. Perhaps that violent history doesn't worry them so much. Well, I think, I think when we look at the population in Algeria, something like 45% of the population today is below the age of 
30. So if somebody was born, let's say, in 1994, he would be 25 today, this person has not lived the civil war of the 90s. They were still a child during the Arab Spring, yeah, even. The, yes, and, uh, but when you talk about 2011, at least yeah. we had a president who could speak to their uh, mm. people. The, uh, the, uh, the price of oil was sky high, $140, 140 a barrel. So the, the government was able to invest in uh, social peace, uh, subsidize goods, uh, increase salaries, and so on and so forth. The national team just made it to uh, South Africa to the World Cup the year before. So there was some kind of enthusiasm, optimism, and so on and so forth. But this time, it's completely different. There were demonstrations, but they were in some pockets only. But now, when we see pictures of the president himself in a wheelchair, uh, with a seat belt, it's very really degrading to uh, the image of the person himself as well as the country. Now the people are looking for jobs, uh, houses, uh, stability and so on and so forth. They want to contribute to the future of their country. And when we see the demonstrations throughout the country, and this is very, very important, uh, from Tlemcen, the birthplace of uh, most of the members of the cabinet, to Annaba and to countries in or to uh, the cities in the south. So th this is for the first time Algerians are united <coughs> around one particular idea. It began with we don't want the fifth term of Botflika. And as the time went by, we saw that the, the people want to bring down the regime. And uh, obviously, with, with, nobody knows what is happening to the president. Unconfirmed reports say he is still in Switzerland on a life support machine. Nobody knows if it's true or false. So the next few weeks, the, the, I think the demands will be uh, even higher. The president on a life support machine, and some might say, Michael, as we heard Yusuf say there, the economy is almost on life support. Worth reminding people watching, this should be a rich country. It's rich in oil and gas. Well, yes, it is. It's, it's a major exporter, particularly of natural gas. And basically, the political fortunes of a country have often followed the economic cycles, and particularly the, the price of, a, uh, of the uh, um, oil and gas, the, as Professor Buandil said. And one of the things that basically allowed President Bouteflika in the early part of his presidency to succeed was, as, as Professor Buandil said, quite high oil and gas prices. But in they rose up until 2014 and then began to see a tumble, which began to put huge pressure on the Algerian economy. Um, Algeria doesn't really produce or export much else, so everything depends on that. And even though the country has not yet run out of money, it's running through its um, uh, reserves, it's having to cut back on the budget, and there isn't really a, an alternative plan B for when, when the money begins to run out, unless the, and apart from hoping that the oil prices increase again. And I think this did actually enforce um, this amongst the population. They're beginning to feel some of the austerity measures. They're beginning to worry about the future. And, and there didn't seem to be an alternative um, policy being operated by the regime. And I think that has certainly fed into the protests and fed into the unhappiness. Amal, we clearly have a protest where lots of people know what they're against. And it's a very organic protest, very young protesters. Isn't the problem, or one of the potential problems, if they were to succeed, there is no organised political leadership among this protest movement? You know, people have been deprived by the right to speak, by the right to uh, find each other, by the right to, uh, to, to take the streets enough not to worry currently about these issues. That's where we must leave our discussion. Thank you to our guests for the analysis of this fast-moving story to Amal Boubaker, Michael Willis and Yusuf Buandel. Every day of the week we focus on one of the world's main issues. You can see this programme again at our previous programmes at aljazeera.com. The team here would love your thoughts. What should we discuss next time? We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story. We're also on Twitter too at AJ Inside Story. I'll see you here again soon. Bye-bye for now.